responsible for sin. This thing that we're talking about in Isaiah was an act of absolute rebellion. And there's a, there's a connotation of violence and deception. In fact, I want to read to you, I don't think I did. The word fallen in Isaiah 14 is the Hebrew word nephal, and it means to fall, to lie, to be thrust out, to collapse, murder, to burst, to cast down, to perish, to topple, and to defect. Satan had it in his heart to put God to death. He had it in his heart to take over the throne of God by any means necessary. Revelation chapter 12 says that he took one-third of the angels with him. He had deceived one-third of the angels into believing that he was capable of taking over the throne of God. Our foe is a tricky fellow. And we're going to get into the reasons why. But it's important that we understand the root of violence, the root of deception, the, the, the murderous act of hate and contempt for God. And consequently for you and I, because we're creating God's image. When Lucifer conceived this lust in his heart to take over the throne of God, there was conceived in him every act of violence and murder and hatred and bitterness and contempt since that moment until the end of the world when God purges all of creation from the effects of his presence. It's important that we realize as we read that because we don't really see that coming out of the scriptures, but that's exactly what the scriptures are telling us. If you've studied history at all, you know that there's no kingdom that's ever been overthrown by another kingdom that didn't result in bloodshed. Right? You're right. You don't overthrow one kingdom to establish another one without bloodshed, without violence, without hatred, without contempt, without evil. Look at World War II. We don't even need to go any further back than that. How many people lost their lives because of Hitler and the Axis powers wanting to overthrow and take over the world? This is at the and this is at the center of what we're reading in Isaiah chapter 14. Let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 28, and we're going to hear what God has to say, beginning with verse 11, from His point of view. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Moreover, the Lord came to me, son of man, raise up a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, <clears throat> thus says the Lord God. So again, we have a picture of the comparison of this king's heart to the fall of Lucifer. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. Carnelian, topaz, jasper, chrysolite, beryl, and on it, sapphire, carbuncle, and emerald. You were wrought in gold were your settings and your engravings on the day that you were created. They were prepared with an, with an anointed guardian, cherub, I placed you. You were on the holy mount of God in the midst of the stones of fire. You walked, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. I want you to hear God very clearly here. So I cast you. These are God's responses to the I will. I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God. And the guardian cherub drove you out from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you by the multitude of your iniquities in the unrighteousness of your trade. You profaned your sanctuaries. I brought forth fire from the midst of you and it consumed you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have come to a dreadful end and you shall be no more forever. Wow. Wow. 
We cannot leave here without pondering the exact nature of this revelation. Pride. We know that pride goes before a fall. We know that pride was at the heart of Luke's first fall. But what caused this pride? What caused the pride to come from him and boil up in him with such a self-deception that he thought he was self-deceived and he thought he convinced himself that he could actually overthrow the throne of grace? I think there's four things here which we're going to take a look at. First of all, the Bible says that he was created in absolute beauty. And as we go through these things, guys, I want us to take a, a, a to do a self-examination because you know we all have things that we need to work on. Amen. Amen. And there's nothing new under the sun. The very same things that cause Lucifer to fall from grace are the very same things that cause you and I to stumble. Amen. Amen. So if we understand what caused the devil to go awry, if we understand what triggered his downfall, then we can protect ourselves from these things and not fall into the snare of the enemy because he's got no new tricks under the sun. He's working with the same bag of tricks that he was working with when Adam and Eve were in the garden reading and nothing new under the sun. He is not. And I, and I love this comparison. A lot of times I heard many, many years ago a pastor that, that said, uh, and I'm just going to do this with you. If I say black, what's the opposite of black? Right. Okay, if I say good, what's the opposite of good? Bad. Okay, if I say uh, morning. Night. Night. Okay, so if I say God, man, see, and that is where we are deceived. Because black may be the opposite of white, good may be the opposite of bad, morning may be the opposite of night, but the devil is not the opposite of God. He's not. Yes, amen, preach it. He's not the opposite of God. He is a created being. He is so inferior to God. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipotent. He's not omnipresent. He is not the opposite of God. But from where you and I stand, he has tricked us into believing that he is the opposite of God. And therein lies the problem. Beauty. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. Listen to the wealth of his being. God created him with these beautiful emeralds and gems that he would reflect the light of God's glory. And there's a terrific study, and I'm not going to get into it today, but there's three more emeralds in the priest's uh, breastplate so that when the priest would go into the inner sanctuary and the light from the menorah would be reflecting in the menorah, the gems in the uh, priest's breastplate of righteousness would glow with a reflection. And many the theologians speculate that God did that to just to, to be a symbol to the, to the enemy and to reflect the glory of God in the light of the flame, which is Christ in our hearts. Wonderful study. He was created with these gems of gold and, and precious stones so that when the light of God's glory passed through him, he would reflect all of heaven's glory. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Listen. The carnelian, the topaz, the jasper, the chrysolite, the beryl, the onyx, the sapphire, the carbuncle, and the emerald were all wrought in gold. And these were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. God created this anointed cherub that that, that would reflect his glory. And it wasn't enough. Now before we pass by here, I can't help but stop and ask myself, or I present to you this morning, is reflecting God's glory enough for you? We get into trouble when we want more than that, don't we? We were reflected to bear the image of, the, of, the, of our creator. We were created to reflect the image of the Son of God who lives in us and walks in us and talks in us. 
And how often do we get ourselves in trouble because we're not content with merely reflecting the glory, but we want it for ourselves. Hey, 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 look at me. Yeah, I just pray for all the little kids. Oh, God, bless God, bless God. Thank you for the little kids. Bless God, bless God. I'm just preaching my own heart here. If it blesses you, then okay. These tendencies are in us because we fell under the same kind of condemnation through Adam's disobedience. Thank God Christ has set us free from those things. But we need to be aware, amen? We need to be aware. On the day that they were created and, and prepared, with an anointed guardian, I, Terah, I placed you, and you were holy on the mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. Now, what most theologians, I'm going to use my board over here because I... Everybody knows how much I love to draw stick figures. And I'm really sorry Mercedes isn't here today because she loves leaving me little notes on my board and I love having her leave little notes on my board. So this is the most uh, eloquent piece of uh, decoration we have in the church, but it is also very wonderful and it's very effective. Most theologians speculate that the throne of God does that look like a throne? Okay. That's not the throne I sit on. <laughs> that around the throne of God were the stones of fire. And these stones of fire, what the Hebrew really gives up an image of, and we know from Revelation and some of the other passages of Scripture in Ezekiel, that there's angels, the four beasts, that they surround the glory of God. They never leave His presence. And all they do, all day, all night, for all eternity, where there is no day or night, they just worship God. And Lucifer could go right in, right up to the throne of God, right into the very inner place of God. And he would come and go. And he would do God's bidding. And he would come and go. And, and his job was to, to go and, and bear the message of God. And he had that privilege of going right into the presence of God. Which is the next reason why he fell. Position. Power and position. We don't need to look far into our culture, into our own government, into civilization, or into the history of the world to know how many times people that have power and position fall into great trial and temptation. Amen? We got a country full of politicians that think that because they have position that they don't have to answer to God nor to the citizens that put them in office. It's a, it's a contagion in our culture that goes all the way back to the fall of Satan. And I would like nothing more than to name several of them off this morning, but for the sake of the peace and unity of the body of Christ, I will not. They're under the same condemnation as the devil. Their power, the position, the responsibility of going into those places like the White House and the Congress and the Senate have corrupted them. And they have come to a place in their understanding where they think they no longer have to be accountable to the people or to the God that put them there. This is the same exact mentality that caused Lucifer to be thrust from God's presence. The idea that because you have uh, access to those places of power and those prestigious halls where decisions are made over people's lives and the multitudes and their outcome of their future lays in the balance of your decisions. It takes a truly humbled heart to rule and rule well. It takes somebody that has been broken and busted down to nothing and knows who they are by themselves and in of themselves. And I am nothing without Christ. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. That's right. In me, there's nothing good. That's right. Should be the cry of each of our hearts because without Christ, we don't even have our next breath. For in Him, we live and move and have our being. That's right. 
God gives responsibility to us. But if we don't have a right heart, we can become just like the devil, corrupted in that place of position. How did he use it? It wasn't enough that he tried to rebel against God himself, but then he convinced the angels of God, many of them, that he was all that in a bag of chips. You are blameless in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. Reason number three, prosperity. How many know that prosperity can corrupt you just like anything else? Amen. 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 God gives wealth to some people so that they can do kingdom business. When we started this church, it wasn't even negotiable. And Melissa does our books, and we appreciate it. Speaking of, it's about time to do our quarterly taxes. <laughs> okay. I'm so grateful to have her and my wife who keep our church accountable. Amen? Amen. What is the solution to greed? Charity. Charity. Absolutely. Charity. To have a giving heart. And I can tell you for all the years that I spent drug, uh, drugging and drinking, I didn't have, man, I didn't have a quarter for anybody because it was going to go toward my next whatever. When God set my free from, set my heart free from that life, He set me free to be a giver, not a taker. Amen. 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 God loves a cheerful giver. And perhaps the reason God loves a cheerful giver because it's exactly opposite of what we are on our own. On our own, we're takers. And you know how we know that's true? Because Lucifer reached for the throne of God that was not his. Because Adam reached for the fruit that was not his to take. And how many times have you and I gotten into trouble when we reached for things that God did not ordain for us to have? The picture of us reaching out and taking hold of things that God did not prepare for us to partake in. At the heart of that is a self-will that's living for the father of lies. Let's go on and read. So I cast you as a profane, profane thing from the mountain of God, and the guardian cherub drove you out. I better get going here. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, and I exposed you before kings. Uh, this is something here. Let's put Isaiah 14. Fourth thing here, and I'm not seeing it. Somebody help me out here where he talks about the timbers and the pipes. Where is that? Uh, it's in 14, you say? No, I think it's in this chapter. Right 22, Jim. Is it 22? No, it should be in this passage. Anyway, it talks about Satan and his timbrits and pipes. And many people believe that Lucifer was uh, was possibly the choir director in heaven. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know. That doesn't normally happen, so forgive me. But it talks about the timbrits and pipes. And many theologians believe that Lucifer had the ability to lead music in heaven, that he was actually called to be the worship director in heaven. Which brings us to our fourth point, and it's not a big deal. It's in 13. Is it in 13? Thank you, Mikey. I passed by it, forgive me. But it's the, the talent. Oh. The fourth thing that gets us in trouble is our talent. Oh. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. God paused you so that that could be emphasized. <laughs> well, notice.
was I'm still I'm still uh, I'm still imperfect in my in my work to you guys, and I'm okay with admitting it. But the point is the talent. How many know? How many have ever been around somebody that's really gifted when it comes to music or writing or cooking or painting? And there's nothing worse than being around somebody that's egotistical about something that they can do and do well. Amen? Amen. Amen. Talent. So when you put these four things together, his position, his talent, his wealth, and his beauty, you get a Molotov cocktail brewing in the emotional realm of this individual. Amen? Amen. And so these are the four things that we have to guard our hearts from, folks. And we each wrestle with some of these more than others. Like, I don't probably have to worry about being beautiful. My wife, on the other hand, does. <coughs> I long ago gave up any notions of that. <laughs> but we all have to guard our hearts against these things. Because we can fall into the same condemnation of the devil if we're not careful. Amen? Amen. I want to point out two things we need to be aware of real quick. Where do you think this fight came from? <coughs> I think, and I've given this passage of scripture a lot of uh, meditation over the years, but I think that brewing inside Satan's heart was this discontentment. I mean, there had to be discontentment in his life. Because if he had been content, loving God, serving God, reflecting God's glory, doing the master's business, coming and going, and, and dispatching uh, whatever it is he was sent to do, and coming back with the joy of knowing, God, I, I've done what you asked me to do, what's next, Lord, mentality, where would, there would have been no room for discontentment, amen? It's this discontentment that was brewing in him, this longing and lust for more. We have to ask ourselves, where did that come from? And I tell you where I think it came from, and I'll tell you this because I wrestled with this in my own life for many, many years. I think it came because he wasn't enough. There's an inferiority at the root of all that there was an inferiority in his heart that it wasn't enough, that God hadn't given him enough, that there was more to be had. This inferiority that by himself being the man or the, the angel that God created him to be wasn't enough. And because it wasn't enough, it created this lust for discontentment which caused him to reach for more and create in his own mind the perpetuation of self-deception that caused him to think that he was more than he was. And what he thought he was was not enough to be what he wanted to be. And it ended up costing him everything. Now I'm preaching real good here because this stuff gets us into trouble. This is right into where the rubber hits the road in our lives. Right. How many times do we get caught up in discontent? How many times do we live with the inferiority complex? How many times do we see, I'm going to call it what it is, Bruce Jenner, anointed athlete, given the world prestige and power, and it wasn't enough. And now he's dressed himself up and become something he was never created to be because in his mind, as a man, he thought he was inferior to something that was never meant for him to be. And this is a this is a this is going crazy in our culture. We are by the thousands, people are conceiving in the in, the, in their mind that what their vision of their lives and who they think they should be is a better plan than God has for them. Right. Oh. And maybe we aren't going to those extremes in our lives. Maybe we're not going to those extremes and the things that we're chasing, but we're just as vulnerable to the lie. That's right. That who I am is not enough. I need to be shorter. I need to be taller. I need to be skinnier. I need to be, I need to have more money. I can't even tell you how many people don't come to church on Sunday morning. I get message after message. I mean, my phone starts going off at seven o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning. Pastor, I can't make it to church this morning. I got to work. Which I understand. I do. you got to earn a living. But many times we forsake being in the house of God. Many times we forsake being among the people of God. Many times we forsake being the people God created us to be. Because we're chasing more. Because we need more. More, 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 more. Instead of just being who God created us to be. And being content with what God has given us. We're chasing 
those things that are outside of ourselves because inside we're not, it's not enough. And that's the thing I want to challenge you with this morning. You are enough. You're enough. The way God created you, you are enough. And you don't need to fall into the same lie that the devil fell into. You're enough. You're beautiful. You're talented. You are a breath from God's very own lips. You are enough. Don't listen to the liar. Don't buy the lie. Just be who God created you to be and be content being that. Yes, God. Be content being who God created you to be. And you'll be all that God created you to be. And I promise you, if you will find satisfaction in that, on Judgment Day, when we stand before God, God's going to grab you by the shoulder. He's going to hug you. And He's going to say to you, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy. I'm not Jimmy Swagger. I'm not David Jeremiah. I'm not Charles Stanley. I'm just some little country preacher that loves God and wants to take some people to heaven with me. You and you know, enough. that's enough for me. You are enough. I, that's enough for me. Oh. Yes. Because to be honest with you, I'm overwhelmed at the goodness of the Lord in my life most days. Amen. So are we. <laughs> and ours. Well. Husbands, we get into trouble when we reach for things that are not up for us to have. Right. Wives, when we start looking at other things that we're not supposed to be looking at or having feelings for somebody else that's not our spouse, these things become real pitfalls that can shipwreck us in a minute. Recognize where they come from. Recognize who's the author of them. Recognize who's the inspiration of them. And pray and ask God for contentment. You're not inferior. God created you to be who he created you to be. And you are on a journey to be all that he created you to be and nothing more. That's right. <laughs> and nothing less. And nothing, and nothing less. less. Amen. Woo. Woo. Amen. And nothing less. What's the cure to this infection that comes through the fall of Lucifer and consequently through the fall of Adam? And how do we get out of that mindset in our thinking? Well, let's go to Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to race through the last couple of passages here. Philippians chapter 2. Chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And I love, I'm in all the passages of Scripture in the Bible. I'm going to tell you, this is in my top 10, this passage of Scripture from Philippians 2, uh, verse 1 through 11. Because if ever there was a passage of Scripture that summed up the heart of our Savior, it is this passage of Scripture. And in so doing it, it also tells us what kind of heart we should have. Everybody find Philippians 2, 1? Yes, sir. Amen. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any, I love the word incentive there, any participation in the spirit, any affection of sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and with one mind. Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. And let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. That's exactly the opposite of what the devil did, isn't it? That's right. Five I wills. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. For myself. The cure for that is to live for something outside of yourself and to live for other people. You will never find the life that God has for you if you do not learn how to be a servant to the kingdom of God, to your family, to your community. God has. The greatest amongst you is a servant of all. And I say that almost weekly. You know why? Because I'm going to keep saying it weekly. Because at some point it's going to sink in for some of us and it's going to go, think, wow, I could have had a V8. <laughs> I could have been doing this the whole time. Don't you love commercials? Have 
this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped for. Jesus didn't need to reach for equality. He was God in flesh. That's right. Amen? He was God in flesh, and he didn't need to reach for it, even though that Satan tempted him with that. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you fall down and worship me. The, 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 the cattle of a, on a thousand hills belong to the Lord. I'm not going to worship you. He didn't need to reach for it. It was already, he already possessed it. Yet, as a servant. Let's go on. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Do you want to be somebody that is truly appreciated? Humble yourself, be obedient, even unto death. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Amen. 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 The cure. There you go. Everything the devil's done for millennia is to empty yourself and be a servant. Amen. This gospel is so simple that even a child can understand it. That's right. Go with me real quickly to Philippians uh, Luke chapter 22. Uh, Luke 22. Beginning with verse 39. As we read this, you're probably going to wonder, what has this got to do? <laughs> Put the phone down, step away from the sound. <laughs> Thanks, honey. We should act. <laughs> I will. I'll go to the room to room when I get home. <laughs> Verse 39. And he came out and he went out and he, and he went out, it was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. As for what? What does this have to do with everything that we talked about this morning? <laughs> I'll tell you. Satan five times said, I will, I will, I will, I will. And myself, I'll do it all. I, I will this and I will that. And I'm going to take over God. And I'm going to put him out of his throne. I'm going to take over the kingdom. The angels are going to worship me. I'm going to 